blood. All the pain. Hey, Crime Salad listeners, welcome back to another episode of Crime Salad, where we talk true crime. I'm your host, Ashley, and with me always is my partner in crime, Ricky. If you noticed in the title, we are doing a throwback this week. It's an oldie, but definitely a goodie. And we're resharing this case for a very good reason. The month of October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Just a reminder, anyone can be an advocate for domestic violence. You don't have to be a professional. The more we educate ourselves on this sometimes uncomfortable subject, the more we can break the repeating pattern. So do your homework and you can visit the hotline.org to educate yourself on this very topic. The story that we're sharing today is Gretchen Anthony's story. It's a very hard one to hear, but it's a case that reminds us if you see something or hear something, say something. As we know it, it can be sometimes scary or very hard to get involved as a bystander, but a call to police witnessing what you heard or saw could be huge for someone who is experiencing domestic violence and could even be life-saving. Now, one interesting thing that we learn in this episode is you can't actually reach 911 through a smart speaker like Alexa or Google Home. This applies to the U.S. I'm not really sure about other countries. And the reasoning is due to regulatory compliance by the Federal Communications Commission, or the FCC, that requires 911-capable devices to provide both location data and a callback number, which for Alexa, that's something that they opted out of. To allow a smart speaker to have the ability to call emergency services, you have to set it up. Sometimes it's with an additional device or a subscription service. So if you want to be on the safe side and you want to have that available to you, you can look up how to set that up. Because if you're in a situation where you don't have your phone or you're unable to get to your phone, you'll hear a perfect example of this in our story today. I mean, it's 2023. You think that by now they would make this happen. But anyway, So they say to try to stick to calling 911 with your phone, and in some areas, you can text 911. So be sure to check to see if your county offers this. All right, let's jump into the episode. For all of us, 2020 was a year of unprecedented loss and change. In fact, the entire world came to a standstill in the spring of 2020 while we were all experiencing the uncertainty of a global pandemic. However, for one man, it was the year his life and his mind began to unravel. David Anthony wasn't coping well with the loss of his nine-year relationship and five-year marriage to his wife, Gretchen Anthony. In the past, David had always struggled with depression and, according to his family, had an undiagnosed bipolar condition. Throughout his life, he had minor brushes with the law and short periods of manic behavior. It's possible many of those events were due to his unmanaged stress and anxiety. Because in the almost 10 years he spent with Gretchen Anthony, he mostly thrived and flourished. Gretchen provided David with unconditional love, but most importantly, she provided him with stability, which was something he lacked throughout his tumultuous childhood peppered with domestic violence. So when Gretchen asked him to move out in December of 2019, David began to lose his grasp on his humanity. Gretchen regrettably explained to his family that while she cared for David and loved him, she was no longer in love with him. She couldn't cope with his periods of self-destructiveness, his jealousy, or his bouts of rage. With a 12-year-old daughter to think about, Gretchen knew she had to make the difficult decision to end her marriage. She hoped it would be the wake-up call that David needed to finally get his life together. She texted her friend and boss, Don Paris, and told her, I wish him well and hope he learns how to deal with his mental health issues. 
I feel bad that I couldn't help, but I think he needs to learn how to love himself before he can love anyone, something he might not experience in his lifetime. Around the same time period, she texted another friend, telling her that I gleaned a hint of that crazy look in his eyes. Whenever he behaved erratically, Gretchen would lock herself safely in her room for the night, waiting for his anger to dissipate. In December, before he moved out, she texted her friend Dawn again. I'm watching him on the cameras and waiting for him to go to bed. Then I'll go downstairs and get a knife to put under the pillow, just in case, and hopefully get some sleep. Out of fear, Gretchen had placed cameras throughout her home, including her outdoor patio and inside her garage. David's unpredictable and erratic behavior after asking him to move out was growing increasingly disturbing. In the past, Gretchen and David had briefly separated a few times, only to get back together again. One of those times was in 2018 when David began experiencing another period of mania. At the time, David was convinced the world was ending and only he was able to pick up on the signs that others were ignoring. So he packed up his truck with bags of rice, tools, and 10 pairs of shoes with plans to drive into the jungle and avoid the impending Armageddon. He and Gretchen had earlier in their relationship visited a resort in the jungle of Costa Rica. To David, Costa Rica became his backup plan in the event Armageddon were to materialize. The final straw for Gretchen was Christmas of 2019 when David became protective about his backpack. Out of intuition, Gretchen went through the backpack and found her wedding ring, her passport, her driver's license, her credit cards, and some cash. That is when Gretchen began to fear her husband, and with a good cause, because what was to come was straight out of her worst nightmares. Before things began to unravel, Gretchen and David were crazy about each other. The two met back in 2010 at Orange Theory Fitness Gym, where David, who was 6'7", swept the petite blonde off her feet. David was one of the top fitness instructors and had a waiting list for clientele. His boss, Tabitha, was friends with both Gretchen and David and said their chemistry was palpable and they made a strikingly beautiful couple. For years, the two were very happy together in Gretchen's Jupiter condo. After a short engagement, they got married in Las Vegas by an Elvis impersonator. Shortly after their marriage, David would occasionally exhibit brief periods of instability. They usually left as quickly as they came. While he refused counseling, he did believe in vigorous exercising, vitamins, and juicing, which helped him to maintain his mental health for longer and longer periods of time. However, when he began to get manic again, his deteriorating mental health began interfering with his job. In late 2017, there were complaints that he was acting aggressive and inappropriate with clients. As a result, Tabitha was forced to fire David. During that time, David began working with Gretchen at Viking Electric, but missed working as a personal trainer. At times, David could be extremely manipulative and relentless when he wanted something and he wanted his old job back. A few months later, he asked Tabitha to meet him for a cup of coffee and he persuaded her to give him another chance. Of course, there were promises that David would be on his best behavior, and for a long while, he kept those promises. With all of David's ups and downs, he never imagined having to go back to live with a 64-year-old mother, yet that's exactly where he ended up after he separated from Gretchen. In David's mind, it was always temporary. He knew he would eventually manipulate Gretchen again and work his way back into her home just like he did with his old job. To show Gretchen he was a changed man, he got involved with an organization called Gratitude Training. He spent thousands and thousands of dollars on courses that taught him to align himself with angels and be the best version of himself that he could be. 
They would require members to do group activities where they would put themselves in uncomfortable situations in order to show growth and determination. Its detractors and some former members have alleged that gratitude training was actually a sex cult. But to David, it was transformative. After graduating from the program, he felt invincible and like he was ready to step back into his old life. And by old life, we mean way before he met Gretchen. When David was 34, he dated a 22-year-old woman whom he tried to control with his jealousy and manipulative personality. He began pressuring her to, quote, grow up, end quote, and spend less time with her friends or doing things that a 22-year-old might want to do. One day when she came home from work, David was inside her apartment waiting for her on bended knee. She assumed he was there to propose, but instead David proposed that they break up and she spends the time working on herself in becoming someone he would be willing to spend his life with. To which she responded, what the fuck is wrong with you? Which is a question we will be asking ourselves throughout this episode. After David completed his gratitude training, he thought it might be a good time to check back in on this old flame and see if she had become worthy of his time and attention. Needless to say, she wasn't interested. But that didn't deter David from moving on. Now that he was the best version of himself that he could be, David was still feeling invincible and tuned into the universe ready to accept his higher purpose in life. His new abilities and mental clarity happened to coincide with talk of a new upper respiratory virus that was reaching epidemic levels we know as COVID-19. This sparked new thoughts of impending Armageddon. David began talking to Gretchen, his family, his friends, and even strangers about these new signs of the apocalypse. The United States was going to go under martial law and be governed by dictators in a globalist plot to take over the world. He also realized that this would be the perfect opportunity to seek revenge against his soon-to-be ex-wife for the crime of rejecting him. And then something tragic happened. On January 26, 2020, Kobe Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter died in a helicopter crash in Calabasas, California, on their way to a basketball game. David, who was overweight as a young child, suffered from low self-esteem and was extremely self-conscious. But his height set him apart from the other kids, and it was his love of all things basketball that gave him his first experiences with success. David played basketball in college, and then he played professionally for a few years in Germany until chronic knee injuries ended his career. So when Kobe Bryant died, David began to spiral into deep grief. His boss, Tabitha, said he acted as if Kobe were his lifelong best friend. It began to interfere with his job, and he would break down in fitness classes, crying over Kobe's death. If anyone tried to comfort him or offer platitudes, he would lash out with inappropriate, displaced anger. To honor his fallen hero, he went out and adopted a husky, which was Kobe Bryant's favorite breed, and named the dog Kobe. He began to fixate on the dog and arranged his schedule around Kobe's needs. Because of this, he would show up late to work or bring the dog with him to work. His bizarre behavior, coupled with his anger around female clients, could no longer be tolerated. Once again, in February of 2020, Tabitha felt she had no other choice but to fire David, this time for good. To understand David's mindset at this time, he is jobless, homeless, without a relationship, and he believes he is the only person who can see the signs of pending doom. David became convinced that COVID-19 was a bioweapon purposely leaked onto the world to implement a global dictatorship. On February 24th, 2020, David went on a date with a woman he had only known for a few weeks. It was a wine and painting class. 
And during this class, he acted extremely inappropriate and began showing a level of affection in public that not only made his date uncomfortable, it was wildly inappropriate. When he took his date back to her place, he began unpacking his belongings into her apartment, including boxes of canned food he had taken from his mother's house. She immediately demanded he leave. Only when she threatened to call the police did he take his belongings and go. After this rejection, he headed over to Gretchen's condo and began banging on her windows and doors, asking to be let in. Eventually, she relented and allowed him to come inside so he would stop making noise. Four days later, Gretchen filed for divorce. Filing for divorce only seemed to anger David more. On March 14th, David packed up all of his things, his dog Kobe, and told his family he was heading to Costa Rica before they shut down the state. He told everyone who refused to go with him that they didn't know how bad it was about to get. They would all be forced to stay inside for a decade, and the world would never again be the way it was. But he didn't just take his things with him. He also stole some things from his mother's ex-boyfriend who still lived with her. He took a bike, some tools, a crowbar, a rake, and a shovel. The next day, his mother was so angry with him that she threatened to call the police if he didn't return the stolen property. Instead, she shut off his phone. That means that David's phone now only worked when it was hooked up to Wi-Fi. David was at an outdoor cafe in Riviera Beach, using their Wi-Fi and talking to young teenage girls in a bizarre manner. That's when police arrived and followed him back to his car. One of the officers noticed that David had altered his license plate with black duct tape to change some of the numbers and letters. It's possible he did these things to avoid being pulled over for the stolen items, but it's also possible that he had other plans that would cause him to want to disguise his car, possibly nefarious plans. At first, David was cooperative with police, when suddenly he lunged into his car reaching under the passenger seat. Under the seat, the police found a large boning knife. However, David insisted that he was merely heading to the car to roll down the windows for his dog, Kobe. Because of those actions, David was arrested for resisting arrest with violence against a police officer. Kobe was transported to an animal shelter and David went to Palm Beach County Jail, where his bail was set at $3,000. Once in jail, David was livid his family wasn't doing more to get him out of there. His mother knew he was in a manic state and was doing everything possible to keep him from going to Costa Rica. She thought leaving him in jail for a few days would be a good idea while he calmed down and came out of his manic state. Both David's brother and sister made up excuses about why they couldn't get him out of jail. So, and I told him, I was like, I knew I was going to be here a while. I just wanted to get some air for my dog because Kobe was in the vehicle. I was just going to roll down my windows a little bit. But, you know, they made up something about uh, the charge is uh, resi resisting arrest with violence. Yeah, that's what, that, yeah, that's what I see online. But it's like I already found out where they got your truck and found it, but they won't let me pay to get it out. They're, they're telling me that they're holding your, your truck for, for investigation, and I've been through the fucking ringer with them. Mom's calling... I guess whoever the officer was that, you know, locked you up or whatever, she's trying to get a hold of him to see why are they holding your truck? They won't let us even, because what, what our thing is, we want to get your truck out so you don't have all these fines. You know what I mean? Yeah, no I don't think, yeah, I just don't think they can release it. That's why I have to get out. <laughs> got you. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that's, how, that's why I have to get out. So, no, I got uh, you. So, I was going to say, but my thing right now, I've been looking every so often, like, they're not holding you to charge you for other shit, right? You just got rid no. of thing? No, that's it. No, that's, there's nothing okay. else they can, no, they, they, they've already searched the vehicle, man. They've already searched yeah, the vehicle. Yeah, so they're just bullshitting, man. Yeah, they just, they're not going to release the vehicle unless I'm there. That's so annoying, yeah.
His brother Trevor continued making excuses at his mother's request. They were hoping the delay would prevent him from going to Costa Rica, and would give him time to calm down. He was anything but calm. He was angry with his mother, but he was also angry with Gretchen. She was the only other person besides David who could show legal ownership of Kobe and get him out of the shelter. Her refusal to help made him livid. During one of his jail phone calls to his friend Eric, he told him he was going to Costa Rica because of the 5G rollout and a prophecy about COVID and the impending chaos. He told Eric that he had met a woman he liked and was hoping she would leave with him to go off grid and live in the jungle. But first, he had an old score to settle and funds to obtain. David's anger with Gretchen only exacerbated while he was behind bars. David may have thought with Gretchen gone, her assets would become his assets and her bank accounts would become his bank accounts. He needed money to start this new life. Eventually, David did manage to get himself out of jail, but his mom did help by bailing Kobe from the animal shelter. He was released from jail on March 18th, and his truck was released from impound on March 20th. We don't know what David did on the 20th, but we do know where he was on the 21st, between 6 and 6.30 a.m. During that time, Gretchen's neighbor heard a woman's voice let out a blood-curdling scream. It said, no, no, it hurts. Because on Saturday morning, at like, I don't, it, I guess it was Saturday because Saturday of the pictures, but I heard, um, I was asleep upstairs in my, uh, in my room, and I heard, I heard a really serious woman scream, like, um, just screaming, like she was being attacked, but she wasn't saying help, she wasn't saying anything like that, and I thought maybe it's kids in the neighborhood or something. My windows were open, I can't really tell where it's coming from, but it really sounded like it was coming from that alley right behind my house. Um, so that alley would be behind, behind 1302 house, yeah. Sunshine Drive, mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely, and then um, I, uh, in, like I was ignoring it, like maybe it was just kids or something, and then it didn't stop, and then I heard her scream no, and then I heard something about it hurts, stop it, and then I got up and came outside and, um, and walked down the alley and then heard a, saw a truck backed in that I didn't recognize. It was backed in a couple doors down. Like, it just sounded like it was coming from here. And I went and just waited outside. I was outside for about 15 minutes. I didn't hear anything else. The truck was running. It wasn't, there wasn't anybody in it. I took pictures of the truck just in case. I didn't, the scream was really serious. And then, um, and I didn't call the police. Um, and then I went back inside. And then later in the morning, I saw the same truck parked on Mallory outside my neighbor's house and I was able to get the, I, I just took a picture of it, I just took a picture of the of the license plate just in case something had happened. Okay. So then when we saw you guys out here, somebody was out here yesterday, somebody was out here today, and um, I, I assumed I had to do something with that. So that's okay. why I came out to tell you guys. Gretchen's neighbor was so upset over the scream that she began walking outside trying to determine where it came from. All she noticed was a black truck with its engine running, parked in Gretchen's driveway. It gave her a really bad feeling and she took a picture. She still wasn't sure where the scream had animated from. So it was March 22nd, and friends, family, and coworkers began getting strange text messages from Gretchen's phone. A message to her friend and boss, Don Paris, stated, tested positive for coronavirus early this morning. That's the bad news, but I'm at a CDC coronavirus treatment facility that only handles COVID cases. The good news is my blood type has potential to be used in the cure. Dr. Sinclair and the team are strongly recommending that we maintain contact with immediate family members only. I'm using my mom. The next day, Dawn texted back, Gretchen, are you okay? Please let me know if you need something. I'm really worried about you. She never got a response. Gretchen's ex, Jeff Dreyer, with whom she shared a 12-year-old daughter, also began getting similar messages from Gretchen. 
Those messages were riddled with poor grammar, spelling, and punctuation. Jeff instinctually knew the text didn't sound like Gretchen. Having been best friends for many years with David Anthony, he thought the messages looked and sounded like something David would write. After receiving another bizarre message from Gretchen stating she was being transferred to a special CDC site for acute COVID cases and going to be on a ventilator, he had had enough. The next day on the 24th, he went down to the hospital and discovered that Gretchen had never been treated at the hospital. There wasn't a special CDC site for acute COVID patients either. When Jeff located Gretchen's car and purse in the parking lot, he knew he needed to contact law enforcement. The next day on the 25th, law enforcement conducted a well check on Gretchen's condo. The driveway was covered in a trail of bleach and soap that drained to the curb. Another neighbor noticed it coming from underneath the garage door a few days earlier. That neighbor also took a photo of a black truck in the driveway along with the license plate. The truck was registered to David Anthony. Upon entry, the police noticed the garage had a strong smell of bleach and cleaning solvents. There were towels in the laundry and another towel with blood-like substances that was later matched to Gretchen. There was also a mist of blood on some of the items in the garage. It was clear to police that something bad had happened in Gretchen's garage. In the corner of the garage near the ceiling, they found wires, wires where there were previously surveillance cameras. The other cameras throughout the house were also removed. Police immediately began treating Gretchen's disappearance as a homicide case, and her estranged husband was their primary suspect. Sue Warner, David's mother, was surprised when police showed up at her door asking for her son. She told them she thought her son might be on his way to Costa Rica. When they mentioned they were looking for Gretchen, she shared that she had spoken to Gretchen the day via text. She informed them that Gretchen was in the hospital with COVID after being placed on a ventilator. When police mentioned that Gretchen wasn't at any hospital and wasn't in contact with her family or even her 12-year-old daughter, Sue began to connect the dots. She said this looked extremely bad and she was willing to cooperate. She had David's phone turned back on to help police track him. David would only use the phone for a few minutes at a time before turning it off. Each time he turned it on, Gretchen's phone would also turn on. It appeared that both phones were traveling with David. Police followed the phone and tracked him to Pensacola, 600 miles away where they found surveillance video of him trying to pawn Gretchen's jewelry. Next, they tracked him 2,000 miles away in Las Cruces, Mexico. Gretchen's phone continued to text family members, insisting she couldn't speak because she was on a ventilator, but was feeling better. Florida law enforcement reached out to the Las Cruces police with a description of David and his truck. Fortunately, the police spotted David and pulled him over. He was traveling alone with his dog, Kobe. While they didn't have enough evidence to hold him, they were able to impound his truck. Inside the truck, the Las Cruces police found Gretchen's phone, two Amazon Echo devices, and six surveillance cameras that looked like they had been pulled out of a wall. David had no choice but to stay in Las Cruces while he waited for his truck to be released. He regularly emailed the detective in charge, and they continued to stall him, telling him his truck was very close to being released. That gave Florida law enforcement time to obtain the cloud server video from Gretchen's home surveillance cameras from the night she disappeared. And the footage confirmed what they already knew. Gretchen was dead. They found David and Kobe on the streets of Las Cruces. David was once again arrested and Kobe was once again headed to an animal shelter. During David's interrogation, he didn't appear to be manic or out of touch with reality. In fact, he came off entirely narcissistic, manipulative, and in complete control of the interrogation. He was practically bullying the detective, taunting him, telling him he couldn't be trusted because he had lied to him and lost his trust. 
You can keep doing that. And I'm you just keep hiding you. from the truth. I'm just telling you. You can keep hiding from the truth, Dan. You want me to cooperate? I've cooperated, and that's what I'm telling you. You can keep hiding from the truth. It is the truth. It's not hiding from the truth. It is the truth. You can keep hiding from what the actual truth is. She is not alive. She is deceased. You're bruising me. No, she is deceased. So you're going to be viewed as a, as a monster animal by all these people. They people already do. Who, no, people who, they already do. people who care about you. They already do. People who and you're care not going to paint a picture of me looking great anyway, so what does it matter, man? Well, uh, unfortunately, it, it, the, the evidence doesn't paint a picture. It's not me painting the picture. Like I told you before, I don't, I don't this isn't personal to me. It's, it's, none of this is personal to me. It's not about well, it me. me, Jared. It's not about me. It is to me, Jared. It's about the other. It's about it's my girl. life, Jared. I understand. No, you don't understand. It is your you life. You don't understand. You don't understand at all. I don't. I don't because I'm not. No, right. You no, are exactly no. right. I, I you don't. You have no idea. Zero. I am zero. One hundred percent. You are right. Zero. Hey, but you are correct, and zero. I don't understand what's going on with you because I'm not you. And I'm not you, Jerry. And I don't understand what's going on with you. That is 100% correct. Police tried to appeal to David's emotional side, except David didn't have one. They played him a clip of his 12-year-old stepdaughter, Ava, telling David she loved him and begging him to please tell her where she could find her mother. Ava stated, David, it's Ava. I love you. I'm scared. I miss mom. I need to know where my mom is. Please do the right thing and tell me where my mom is. Please. I love you. At first, David was unmoved, but then he just refused to believe it was Ava. He continued gaslighting detectives, telling them the opposite of what they were showing him wasn't true. They showed David a photo of himself reaching up to a camera in Gretchen's garage wearing green gloves. In the background of the shot was a woman on the floor covered in blood. In fact, her hair looked red instead of blonde. David insisted those photos could have been doctored, and Gretchen was 100% alive. He would repeatedly interrupt the officers, demanding they call a family member of his to help get Kobe back to Florida. Police told him that his family members refused to help with the dog unless he told them where to find Gretchen. Again, David called them liars. He still believed that he could talk his way out of this predicament. He told them all of their evidence was meaningless. The video of him leaving Gretchen's car at Jupiter Hospital was at Gretchen's request. Likewise, with the jewelry he pawned in Pensacola, that was also Gretchen's request. He did, however, finally admit that she never had COVID and was trying to buy time from the people who were after her. He told an elaborate tale that Gretchen was a whistleblower and had uncovered financial misconduct where she worked at Viking Electric. He told them that the conspiracy ran deep and even the police could be involved and he would never risk Gretchen's safety by telling them where they could find her. He told them that she asked for a ride to El Paso and that's where he last saw her. Police were getting frustrated and told him what they saw on surveillance cameras, believing that would get him to finally confess. They told him that they saw him waiting on Gretchen's patio. They heard Gretchen ask him to leave through the door. She opened the door and asked him what he was doing. That is when he grabbed her and put his hand over her mouth while holding a knife. Detectives heard Gretchen scream, no, no, help me, please stop, what are you doing? David then dragged her towards the garage where she was heard on the video yelling, Alexa, turn on the garage light. When the lights came on, she screamed, Alexa, call 911. The only problem was Alexa hadn't been hooked up to the 911 system. Maybe Gretchen knew that and she was only trying to scare David into thinking that the police were coming and leaving. But that didn't happen. She screamed, Alexa, call 911 one more time. But this time her voice was fading. Her very last words were to Alexa, again, pleading for the device to call for help. 
After Gretchen went silent, the video showed David reaching up towards the camera and ripping it from the wall. Despite the dispositive evidence, David refused to admit that Gretchen was dead at his own hands. He delusionally thought that as long as they couldn't find a body, they couldn't charge him with murder. He was wrong, of course. On May 14th, 2020, David was extradited back to Palm Beach Jail, where he stayed while still believing he would eventually be let out. He was angry with his family for allowing his dog Kobe to be adopted by another family in New Mexico. He was truly alone. Finally, in December 2020, David did what David does best. He asked for mercy for himself. He made a deal on his own behalf, offering to tell Gretchen's family where they could find her body in exchange for a reduction in charges and the death penalty taken off the table. Authorities found Gretchen buried just three miles from her home, wrapped in a blanket from her own bed. She was buried in a shallow grave in a wooded area behind a Walmart and a nursing home. Her cause of death was stab wounds to her neck and torso. In exchange for Gretchen's body, David was charged with second-degree murder with a sentence of 38 years behind bars. At his sentencing hearing, Gretchen's sister Sarah Carey spoke directly to David. She told him, You are pure evil. You stole a mother away from her child, a daughter away from her mother. You are a monster. You are a coward. And you will never be forgiven. Of course, David wasn't going to allow anyone but himself to have the last word. He read his statement to the court, which stated, There is no excuse for what I have done. I disgraced my family and brought shame upon my name. Gretchen brought light into this dark world. Instead of being a man, I tried to be a coward. I can't give her life back. I can't fix this. What do you say in a situation like this? When will the pain end, knowing that I'm the cause of it? Coming from me, what words can console a family who has lost someone so dear, so tragically? I created irreparable damage in the world of people who loved me. Gretchen loved me, Ava loved me, and Gretchen's family loved me, and I show that love with a cold-hearted evil act. I know I am hated beyond words, and some have called for my death, and I can't really argue against that. All I can offer is acknowledgement of my actions and pray for forgiveness for my loss of self-control and for allowing my paranoia and addiction to drive this heinous act. My delusions saw the COVID-19 pandemic as an end of the world prophecy. Each day I am reminded of Gretchen. Gretchen was beautiful, kind, smart, giving, and she loved with her whole heart. She was someone who brought light into this dark world. She tried so hard to help me shake out of my own darkness and to see all the beautiful things that life has to offer. Not only did I steal her life, but I stole the time she would share with her daughter, her family, and those who loved her. It hurts so much, but it will never compare to the hurt I've caused to anyone. David couldn't really take the blame. He blamed COVID and his paranoia, which he claimed was caused by his addiction to marijuana and his untreated mental health issues, which he insinuated were the fault of his family. Gretchen's family believes his actions were in retaliation against Gretchen for rejecting him and having the audacity to leave him. Many people live with bipolar disorder, even untreated, and they don't kill people. Maybe David was being sincere, or maybe this was just more manipulation by a narcissist who didn't get his way and chose to use COVID as a cover-up while he took the life of a beautiful mother, daughter, sister, and friend from those who loved her most. And that is our episode for this week. We would love to know your thoughts on this case. Please comment on our Instagram account or on Twitter. Crime Salad is a Weird Salad production. Are you kidding me? That was perfect.